and you have billions and billions of dead things and rocks laid down by water all over the world, uh, I think you've got a pretty strong argument for catastrophic judgment. In the first video, we looked at the reality of all that sediment laid down by water. In this video, we're going to look at the billions and billions of dead things. Creationists like Don Patton seem to agree with this claim made by Answers in Genesis. So what do we expect to see from the record of the Bible? Well, let's take a look at the sequence we saw in the first video, this time from the perspective of fossils. God created the earth, here it is. Several generations later, everything was flooded. So nearly all the animals and humans got buried under a lot of muddy sediment. And of course, all the forests and the grasslands got buried too. This is the theory Don Patton subscribes to. But if you had a flood, wouldn't it just mix everything up? Not necessarily. You have floods that bury things basically where they are, transporting sometimes, but the general rule is things get buried where they live and not everything lives at the same place. So according to Don Patton, the biblical flood would have buried everything pretty much where it stood. Well, that makes things easy. All we have to do is dig down and we'll find this layer of dead animals all over the world. But it's not there. For 200 years, we've drilled down, dug down, sunk mine shafts and explored the hundreds of feet of rock that lie under our feet. And the flooded layer of buried animals that Patton tells us is there isn't. Even Patton can't find it because if he had, he'd tell us where it is. Instead, what we find is this, fossils distributed throughout the various layers of sedimentary rock. Even fellow creationists seem unwilling to endorse Patton's idea because the distribution of different fossils through hundreds of layers of rock is so obvious and clearly observable that it's impossible to argue that a global flood buried these animals where they stood. Just look at this sequence of sedimentary rocks from the Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. According to Don Patton, we should find dinosaurs and other land animals at the bottom, then a lot of flood sediment on top of them. But we don't. Instead, we find the opposite. There are trilobites and other small marine animals at the bottom, then lots of deposits from different marine environments, until we reach a layer with lizard fossils, above that a layer with dinosaur tracks, above that a layer with dinosaur fossils, and above that a layer with mammal fossils. So most creationists have abandoned the idea of animals dying where they lived. They came up with the idea that this flood was quite violent, with lots of currents moving around, so all the animals got swirled around with the sediment and mixed up. If that's the case, then the rocks under our feet should look something like this. All the fossils mixed up and buried together with the old soil layer at the bottom. But we don't find that either. Even if you don't accept the age of these rocks, there's no getting around the fact that different layers yield different fossils. If all the animals lived in the same place, then they couldn't have lived at the same time because they're neatly buried on top of one another, separated by lots of different sediments. But creationists argue that they did live at the same time. OK, then, how come each group of animals, trilobites, corals, lizards, dinosaurs and mammals, has ended up so neatly separated into different layers within a range of different marine sediments? This isn't just true at the Dinosaur National Monument. Larger dinosaurs are only found in Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks. Large mammals are only found in sedimentary deposits of the Cenozoic. Trilobites are only found in Paleozoic rocks and so on. Even if you don't accept the age of these rocks, there's no getting around the fact that different layers yield different fossils. According to creationscience.com, what puts animals at different levels is their buoyancy after death. Here's what the website says. In an unpublished experiment at Loma Linda University, a dead bird, mammal, reptile and amphibian were placed in an open water tank. Their buoyancy in the days following death depended on their density while living, the build-up and leakage of gases from their decaying bodies, the absorption or loss of water by their bodies and other factors. But as every school kid knows, to maintain neutral buoyancy in a liquid of uniform density, work has to be done. That's the principle of a toy called the Cartesian diver. Dead animals either float or they sink. But Loma Linda is a Seventh-day Adventist university, so miracles probably happen a lot more in their experiments than they do in less God-fearing universities. It's a shame that Dr. Karen Jensen, who makes the claim, has decided not to publish her results, so we'll never know how this miracle happened. But even if it did, the conclusion derived from the experiment makes no sense.
That experiment showed that the natural order of settling following death was from the bottom up, amphibian, reptile, mammal, and finally bird. So what? That's not the order in which we find these animals in the sedimentary layers. We find plenty of birds in sedimentary layers underneath amphibians, and we find plenty of reptiles above mammals. Let's try another wacky guess. So this hypothesis goes something like this. A stupid animal like a chicken starts getting wet but can't figure out that this is a bad thing and just stands there while it drowns. A slightly more intelligent animal like a kangaroo will move a little bit away from the rising water because it has slightly more intelligence, but for some reason not enough intelligence to keep moving. Look, even if you believe animals behave in this incredibly stupid way, it still doesn't explain the distribution of fossils in sedimentary rocks. We find lots of primates buried below lizards and giant sloths, so in the fossil record there's no correlation with intelligence and mobility any more than there's a correlation with miraculous buoyancy. So how else can people who want to believe in a global flood explain the ordered sorting of fossils? Of course, they go running to answers in Genesis. Unfortunately, it doesn't have an explanation either. The closest I could get was an article by Bodie Hodge, who tries to explain why human and dinosaur fossils are never found in the same sedimentary rocks. Nowhere in Answers in Genesis is there an explanation for the lack of other anachronous species found together. When I started this debunk of the biblical flood, I had an array of different issues I could have looked at. Where the water came from, where it went, why we find tropical climate fossils in Antarctica, how all the ark animals could have dispersed around the world, and so on. And then I could have had fun with the creationist explanations, from continents that move at running speed, to water canopies in orbit, to comets that spread coldness. All miraculous events that apparently defied the laws of physics, but didn't leave a trace of evidence. So I wanted to find something which has left an indelible trace, something that even creationists can see and understand and have to explain, distinct and different layers of sedimentary rock and an ordered sequence of fossils within those rocks. No biblical flood believer can deny that this is what we find, and so far no biblical flood believer can explain it. I'm sure I'll get a lot of posts from people who'll tell me there's evidence that the Grand Canyon was formed by a flood and that polystrat trees were buried by a flood and the hydroplate theory explains where all the water came from. Don't worry, I'm going to tackle that bullshit in separate videos. I want to focus your attention on just these two questions about the biblical flood. What we find in the rocks is not what Hovind, Patton and Ham have told you. I think they owe you an explanation.